Welcome. I'm Dr. Len Calabres from the R.J. Fazenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology, welcoming you to TB testing in the 21st century. This webcast is by my good friend Art Kavanaugh. I've challenged Art to discuss the detection of latent TB in immunosuppressed population, a particularly problematic area. Uh, Art, in the next 20 minutes, is going to talk about the operating characteristics of both old world and new world testing. Art is a professor of medicine at the University of California at San Diego. Welcome, Artie. Well, thank you, Len, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel and on this project. And what Len has charged me to do is to talk about the detection of latent tuberculosis, or LTBI, in an immunosuppressed patient population, such as we commonly see in our rheumatology practices, and to look at the data about IGRA testing in this population. And that's what I will cover in this segment. A little history, which I think is relevant to get us to what we'll be discussing right now, and also to think about where we're going to go in the future. Uh, of course, with tuberculosis, is something that we learned. We learned early on as we were particularly using TNF inhibitors, we learned about the adverse events. And the tuberculosis was one that really popped up early and really brought itself into our consciousness, something we needed to pay attention to. Of course, we always knew that TNF was a two-edged sword, that it did a lot of good things, like prevent us from inf getting infections, particularly tuberculosis, but also that it has a prominent role in autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis. So we're focusing a lot on the safety, but of course we realize that the therapies such as TNF inhibitors have been very valuable in controlling the signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis and other systemic autoimmune diseases. A little more history in terms of tuberculosis. From the time of Machiavelli, it's been known and it's been a tricky disease. And I think a very nice quote in that, in the beginning, TB is easier to cure, but more difficult to detect. Later, when people are sick, it's easier to detect, but then it's more difficult to really cure. And that's our challenge. How do we detect it at an early stage so that the treatment can be easy? Looking at tuberculosis in the setting of TNF inhibitors, this is an area that perhaps we should have realized as we were using the TNF inhibitors that this is something we needed to pay very strong attention to because animal models suggested that reactivation of TB or an increased severity of TB was something that you would see potentially with inhibition of TNF. But animal models are not perfect. And I think as we think of newer therapies with distinct mechanisms of action, what we talk about, particularly for screening for tuberculosis and treating it in our patients on TNF inhibitors, will also be relevant to therapies with other mechanisms of action. There's some data that speaks to the best way of screening for patients. And we've heard in other discussions in this session about the PPD, the tuberculosis skin test, compared to the interferon gamma releasing assays, or the IGRAs. I think a nice study which addressed this was the START study. The START study was essentially a safety study of the TNF inhibitor infliximab with nearly 1,100 patients. The patients were selected so that many of them had comorbid diseases, including 45 patients who had latent tuberculosis. Uh, they also included a number of people who had had active tuberculosis that was treated. In the 45 cases, they picked up the tuberculosis through PPD or TST screening, treated them with prophylaxis, put them in the study where they got the TNF inhibitor along with methotrexate, and they did well. None developed active TB. In that same study, though, they did have seven patients who developed tuberculosis. And these were PPD negative at the start or TST negative at the start, and presumably they were anergic. So I think a couple of messages with this. One is we need to screen, but we need to know more about the optimal screening methods. And I think that get, brings us to concepts of energy and then to different testing in addition to or perhaps to replace the tuberculosis skin test. Energy or the inability to react to immune stimuli has certainly been something we've known about for quite some time. Uh, certainly, this seems to be an issue in our patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, 
And this is a study published decades ago that looked at this in the top part of the slide, looking at the number of positive antigens. So for the younger persons watching, it wasn't uncommon when we did skin testing to put controls, things to which all of us were exposed to and should react. If you put six antigens in, what you see is that for healthy persons, quite a number of them will react to three or four or five, and some even react to six. However, the rheumatoid population is a little bit left shifted, so there clearly is more energy with a significant number of patients not responding or responding only to a single antigen. This was reproduced more recently by a group from Peru, by Ponce de Leon and Associates, and it came to a similar conclusion. This looked at the size of the tuberculin skin test, the TST, or the millimeters of induration with the PPD. And what they saw is that the controls had more robust reactivity and that there appeared to be energy in the population and that a substantial number of patients with rheumatoid arthritis did not respond, had negative tests. So energy is an issue and it's one that we've had to deal with. And as we saw from the START study, it's one that has very practical implications. Well, this brings us to the IGRIS, the interferon gamma-releasing assays, and there's been a lot of interest in them, and there has been some published, and we'll go through some of those studies and see how they speak to being able to use them, particularly in our patients, patients in a vulnerable population, that is patients on immunosuppressives. There are two that are widely available, the quantiferon and the T-spot. There are some differences between them, and I think there are some publications done in different parts of the world that uh, suggest there may be some differences, perhaps even racial differences among persons and how they respond to these. Certainly we need to learn more about that, but I think in general, and for the purposes of this discussion, we'll speak about them as relatively interchangeable. Well, there, there is a uh, CDC, publication on this. There's a website that deals with this. It was updated last summer, and I have no doubt that it will continue to be updated because this is an important issue. When you think about using an IGRA to detect TB infection, certainly there are definite advantages. In some ways, it's easier because it requires a single visit. The results can be available relatively quickly. One that's very important in many areas of the world is that prior BCG vaccination, which can make the PPD or tuberculin skin test falsely positive does not make the IGRA falsely positive because those antigens are distinct and they use antigens for the test that are specific for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Also, there's no booster effect. We've gotten used to using a PPD test over time and one of the ways that people may obviate energy is to do booster testing, to do that on purpose but that's less controlled. And the fact that you don't get a booster, I think is a good thing and is an advantage for the IGRA. There are some disadvantages or limitations. And I'll call your attention to an area where there's unfortunately limited data, not as much data as we would like. An important area for rheumatologists is immunocompromised persons. And that certainly fits with our patients who have lesser immune function on the basis of their systemic inflammatory disease. And we've known that, uh, that the energy that we saw relates to the rheumatoid as much or perhaps more than it does to the treatment. And then also our treatments. Our treatments can, um, we, we will suppress the immune system. We just don't have enough data on what that does to these particular assays. There is some and it's encouraging and we'll review that. Interesting aside that was also on the CDC and the MMWR uh, that addressed a question which is going to come up and it's going to come back, I think, in the future. And that is when you're using the IGRA test, if you choose to use it, what about using both? What about using the PPD or the tuberculin skin test and using the IGRA? Well, overall, the recommendation is that you don't need to use both. But when you read the exceptions as listed here, I think it's relatively easy to see that many of these scenarios fit with the patients that we're treating. That is that if the initial test, whichever is negative, but your suspicion is very high and you want that confirmation, that is where you may go. Or if the test was indeterminate, or even if the test was positive, 
but the implications of treatment for that are large enough. And I think in these circumstances, many of our patients could be penciled into one of these areas where perhaps doing both tests may not be unreasonable. Well, what about the data? And there is some good data that speaks to that. And also from the Peru, and again from Ponce de Leon and colleagues, uh, published a couple of years ago now, is I think a very nice study uh, testing for latent tuberculosis in RA patients. Now, the study was done in Peru. And in Peru, there is a very decided prevalence of the exposure to tuberculosis, the prevalence uh, 100 in 100,000 in the general population. They did this in a hospital where there's even higher incidence. Uh, what they found was looking at the PPD and assuming that the control population, which was age and sex and gender match, and also matched for comorbidity and nutritional status, that the PPD rate would perhaps be the true one, and that if the RA patients were negative, that would be a false negative. And looking at it, what you see is that in younger persons, it seems to be both tests work well. However, above age 40, and certainly in persons over 60, what you see is a real fall off, such that there is a, I think, unacceptably high risk of false negative testing by PPD. When they did the IGRA testing, what they found was that it performed better. So that certainly in the younger persons, 20 to 40 and 40 to 60, the IGRA testing did not show the fall off in the rheumatoid arthritis population. In the older persons, there was a little bit of a fall off. So it's not an absolutely perfect test. And I think in older persons, which we see in our clinics, we need to be aware of that. Interestingly, these authors came to a conclusion that it may be better to use both sorts of tests although the data that they generated did not really speak to that. You know, there have been quite a number of studies, a couple of dozen so far, in immunosuppressed patients, and we'll show a review of that. Uh, an issue that we have with them, certainly in rheumatology, and this has been spoken of in the other sessions that you will see as part of this program, there's not a gold standard, meaning that when we have a positive or negative result, we don't know what to do with that. Ideally, we'd like a lot of patients treated, treated with the immunosuppressive agents that we have, and then to see who develops actual tuberculosis. That would be the perfect experiment, but it would require so many patients to do that, and if you were withholding therapy, it would have ethical issues. So I don't know that we'll see that. A number of studies then look at surrogates, such as how tests perform in patients who have TB risk factors. For example, persons who come from endemic areas, persons who have uh, contact with people with tuberculosis. There are a couple of studies, and one is shown here. This is uh, published in the Annals of Rheumatic Disease in 2008, showing two things. One is that uh, comparing the IGRA to the tuberculin skin test, it seems that in the persons who have more TB risk factors, the IGRA performed better there was a greater difference in those not exposed and those exposed, suggesting, suggesting without the gold standard that it may be a more useful test. And also, as we have known, and that is that people who were BCG immunized, the IGRA seemed to be a more pure test with less carryover, if you will, from the BCG vaccination, which can show up in tuberculin skin testing. Other studies have also tried to address this. There's a study published in Arthritis and Rheumatism in 2008 from a group in Taiwan. A complicated algorithm where they did tuberculin skin testing, treated patients who they had, said had latent TB, did repeat tuberculin skin testing, then did IGRA testing, and made some decisions based on that. The difficulty is that the numbers are small. The investigators did a lot of work in this, but to really know how useful any strategy is, ultimately we'd like to know what is going to be the outcome, and the outcome would be the development of tuberculosis. In this case, they did have a couple of cases of tuberculosis. Those cases were indeed positive on the IGRA, although one was positive on the second tuberculosis skin test, although not positive on the first. So it's a, it's a mix of data, and again, interestingly, these authors came to the conclusion also that combination testing, as they did in a serial fashion, might be useful. So as a reference, on the CDC website dealing with the IGRA, 
there's a nice listing of the studies that look at these tests in immunocompromised persons. Some of them in rheumatology studies, of course, which are as interest to us as rheumatologists, others in other immune suppressed populations. Uh, quite a number of studies, as you can see, in the first table looking at one of the tests, the quantiferon, in the second table uh, looking at the T-spot. So there is some data, although many of the studies share some of the limitations, and a big one being that we don't have the gold standard to know what is the absolute best. One issue that also comes up in the literature is variability. And when we think of the IGRA test, we get the result. Well, what happens to that result over time? What would happen if you sent the same person back over and over and repeated the testing? In the repeat test variability is something very important to us for all our medical tests. Well, there's a systemic review or systematic review of this that was just published. And what they did is look through the entire world's literature, came up with four studies that addressed variability of the tests, mostly in healthcare workers, so healthy persons, also looked at boosting. And they ended up with 13 studies that they thought had sufficient quality on the question of whether or not the skin test boosts the IGRA. And what they found was that you can have a variability, and the variability seemed most pronounced at about the cutoff, meaning that persons who were close to the cutoff but were negative then could convert and become positive, or, like, or the other way, they could revert and become negative. They also saw a fair amount of boosting. So variability and the potential for boosting are something we may have to consider as we use these tests more, and certainly if we would use them in a serial fashion. The uh, French group has been interested in this for a while. They have recently come up with a suggested algorithm that looks at the proposed method for testing in a serial fashion. They would propose uh, using uh, one of the IGRAs first, depending on the results, either acting or if it was indeterminate, using the other IGRA test. Then, if there were still indeterminate results, only then would they use the tuberculin skin test. And in this uh, study, that algorithm was based on what they did looking through a number of centers throughout France, and they found that if you use the IGRA and acted on that, you would potentially not over-treat persons for whom you might treat if the PPD was positive. But again, uh, one of the issues with this is we don't have the gold standard to know what the exact right answer is. So possibly, I think, in this topic, one of the most important slides, one of the most important discussions is about the research agenda. A lot of questions we would still love to have the answer to, which will help us use these tests best in our patients and then optimize the care of our patients. So we've spoken about the lack of a gold standard, and that really interferes with how well we can interpret the test. Interesting other questions. Is the risk of TB higher in persons who are both, who are positive for the IGRA and positive for the skin test, compared to those where only one is positive? What about the levels? The tests come back with different levels of positivity, although they say positive. You can look at the number and say this one seems to be a much higher response than another. Does that correlate with a greater risk of developing active tuberculosis? Variability we talked about. Variability being particularly important around the cutoff when people can seem to revert or convert. And that too, what are the optimal cutoffs? And are they different in different populations? racially different, genetically different, or different according to comorbidity and concomitant medications. How does the test change over time? One of the things about the PPD is that if it's positive, we're used to thinking that it will always be positive. What about the IGRA? Ideally, if we had latent tuberculosis and we treated it, say on the basis of a positive IGRA, we'd like to see the test become negative so that perhaps we could repeat it in the future. There's not enough data to actually suggest that, although it does seem, perhaps more so in persons with real tuberculosis than in just latent tuberculosis, that if you successfully treat, you may make the level go down and may go from positive to negative. We would like that, but to be useful in the clinic, this has to be very, very strong. And then finally, how do factors such as lymphocyte counts, in addition to age, concomitant medications, how does all that affect the IGRA results? And I think, we're going to use this information to really help us 
better use our immune modulatory therapies. What we want is safety, and to do this, we need to stratify and assess our patients, reevaluate and reassess on an ongoing basis, hopefully with the best knowledge about the optimal use of tests such as the IGRA in our persons who are immunocompromised, and hopefully then allow us to treat their serious rheumatic diseases in the best possible way. Thank you for participating in the program.